So hello everyone and welcome to tonight's community meeting for the bus network redesign project. My name is Reagan Cecchio and I will be serving as the moderator for tonight's meeting. Next slide. I would like to note that all MBTA activities, including public meetings, are free of discrimination. The MBTA complies with all federal and state civil rights requirements, preventing discrimination on the basis of race, color, national origin, limited English proficiency, and additional protected characteristics. We welcome the diversity from across our entire service area. If you have any questions or concerns, please visit mbta.com forward slash title six. That's title V I to reach the Office of Diversity and Civil Rights. Next slide. I would also like to remind everyone of the rules for participating in this meeting, as well as uh, let you know that this meeting is being recorded. Before we can begin tonight's presentation and conversation, I do have to review a few technical aspects of the Zoom platform. Next slide. We have ASL interpreters tonight for the meeting. If you would like to view the ASL interpreter at all times, please keep your view settings in gallery mode. To pin the interpreter's video, click the ellipses in the top right corner of the interpreter's video and select pin video. You will need to repeat this process each time we switch interpreters. We also have interpreters tonight who are translating the meeting into Spanish and Mandarin. If you require these services, please click the interpretation button on your screen and select which language you wish to hear. In addition, we will be holding breakout sessions later in the meeting. If you would like to be in a Spanish language or Mandarin language breakout room, please message a project team member in the chat so that we can move you into the appropriate discussion section at that time. I'll note at this point that after the breakout sessions, we will come back together as a group to hear comments from elected officials and then Q&A tonight. At this time, I will ask that all English language speakers um, select English as their chosen language. This will allow you to hear translated non-English comments during the Q&A. Next slide. You can view closed captions by clicking the closed captions feature and selecting from the options shown. Show subtitle will display a caption at the bottom of the screen. View full transcript will display the meeting's audio transcription in a window to the right. Next slide. All attendees will be muted during the presentation to prevent excessive background noise. If you are viewing this meeting on a computer, you can toggle speaker view to see the pre presentation more prominently. If you are on a smartphone, you can swipe to change views. As I mentioned, later in the meeting, we will be holding a Q&A session. We ask that you hold substantive comments and questions until that point. If you have a technical problem, please share your issue in the chat feature to a member of the project team at any point during the meeting, and we will respond as quickly as possible. All project staff members are listed with project team next to their names in the participant list. I'll note that we are not during the main meeting accepting uh, questions during the chat feature, so please only use the chat uh, during this main portion of the meeting for technical issues. At any point tonight, if you use inappropriate language, you will be removed from the meeting. And now I would like to introduce Justin Antos, Senior Director of Bus Transformation at the MBTA, who will begin this presentation. Justin. Thanks, Reagan. Uh, good evening. Um, my name is Justin Antos. I'm the Senior Director of Bus Transformation here at the T. I am excited to be here tonight to kick off this second public meeting uh, in this phase for our bus network redesign. Um, at, this is the second meeting on the topic. Uh, for those of you who tried to join the first but were unable, uh, we apologize for the technical limits 
Um, and we thank you for joining tonight where we are back with a much higher participant limit on this Zoom platform. Um, and for those uh, who weren't able to get in, we, we apologize for that. Um, why am I excited tonight? Um, well, I think as we, we, as we all can agree, um, transit is essential to our region's economy and I'm excited about it, um, especially post pandemic, MBTA buses um, showed that they serve our most transit dependent um, populations. Uh, early in the pandemic, bus ridership was the most resilient of all MBTA modes. Um, but our region has changed um, over the past few years and decades, and we need a bus service that changes with it. Um, it's essential that the MBTA's bus network adopts to how, where, and when people are traveling now, because it is different than what it was in the past. Back in May, uh, we released a draft bus network proposal. And over the summer, um, we received over 20,000 public comments on it. Um, we've reviewed all of those, we've read all of them, um, and we've had dozens of meetings um, with cities, residents, elected officials, conversations at bus stops, um, and, and learned over the past few months of what folks liked and what folks didn't like about the proposal. We said that we would make meaningful changes based on what we heard. Um, and we are here tonight to tell you about not only what we heard, but what we changed in response. I will say uh, the public comment period for this specific proposal ended last summer. Um, and the goal tonight is for us to explain what we heard last summer and also how we responded to it and how we changed in response. That said, our goal is still the same, to create a better network, more equitable service for our riders and transform the entire system uh, by creating bus routes that are frequent, um, reliable and connect to more places and are easier to use. Um, how do we do that? We still plan to increase service by 25% across the network. Um, we also plan to provide hundreds of thousands of riders with high frequency service. You'll hear that term a lot tonight. High frequency service means a bus route with a bus stopping at a bus stop every 15 minutes or better, all day long, seven days a week. Now, to make these improvements, uh, we had to consider trade-offs uh, and, and, and we were unable to make every change that you requested of us. Um, we, we cannot please everyone all the time, um, but we did ultimately make changes to two thirds of the routes in the proposal that you will hear about tonight. So last, I'll close by saying that this is our bus network. It's not my bus network. It's not your bus network. It's not the MBTA's bus network. It was our network together. We know there are things in this plan that you like. And there are things in this plan that you might not like. But this is our bus system. And we care deeply about it. Everyone here on the team, including myself, ride the bus uh, and care deeply about it. Um, so I just wanted to say thank you for being here tonight to help us build a better bus network. Now back to Doug Johnson project manager for the bus network redesign. Thank you, Justin. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight. As Justin mentioned, my name is Doug Johnson, and I'm the project manager for bus network redesign. Tonight's meeting will begin with a brief presentation about bus network redesign and the changes that have been made to the proposal that we published back in May. As you all know, back in May, we published a draft network map, and we solicited public feedback on it through September. We ultimately received over 20,000 comments on the draft proposal, and we've incorporated that feedback into a revised network map that we will present to you tonight. I'll give a general overview of the changes that were made, and then we'll move into breakout rooms where project team members will give presentations about the changes made to specific areas of the network. In those breakout rooms, you will have the opportunity to ask questions about the changes that were made. After about an hour, we'll return to the main Zoom room for a Q&A session. At the start of the Q&A, we will call on elected officials first. If you are not able to stay for the whole meeting, but would like to leave a comment about the revised bus network, you can either post a comment in the chat and we will add it to our records, or you can submit a comment through our online comment form. A link to that form will be posted in the chat for everyone to see. 
I'm going to keep my presentation here as brief as I possibly can so that we can go into the breakout rooms and folks can have the maximum amount of time to answer questions. But I do want to start by noting that bus network redesign is part of a much larger effort at the MBTA known as the Better Bus Project. The Better Bus Project has, is an initiative that's been ongoing for several years and encompasses a number of different efforts to transform, modernize, and decarbonize the entire MBTA bus fleet. That includes modernizing the maintenance and storage facilities, implementing bus transit priority across the network, things like bus lanes and signals specific for buses, as well as upgrading bus stops, making all of them accessible, um, changing the way that we collect fare on buses, and redesigning the entire bus network. So the bus network redesign is one facet of this larger effort and helps inform them and make all of them a possibility. The bus network redesign specifically is an effort to redesign the entire bus network so that it will better serve the needs of the region. As folks know, the bus network really hasn't changed very much in many decades. It's really a vestige of the old streetcar network um, that ex existed about 100 years ago. Um, it hasn't really changed too much in that period of time, but the needs of the region have changed a lot. Even before the pandemic, changes in land use, changes in the way people get around, um, working hours, things like that, really created a mismatch between the bus network and the region. We're seeking to address that by redesigning the network so that it better meets the needs of people today. We started this process by prioritizing equity. That's the needs of the people who depend on bus service most, including low-income populations, uh, communities of color, seniors, people with disabilities, people who live in households with few or no vehicles. Um, those are people who are more likely to be dependent on transit to get around. So those are the people that we want to prioritize in this process and make sure that we're really serving as well as we possibly can with the new bus network. We're providing more frequent service in you know, some of the most populated places providing more all-day service, creating new connections to more places, especially outside of downtown Boston, creating a network that's simpler and easier to use, and as I mentioned, creating more transit priority and other infrastructure to generally improve the reliability and accessibility of the bus network. We've developed this revised network using a set of service design principles and the public feedback that we received over the summer. We are prioritizing frequency over one seat rides, creating more rapid transit connections and more crosstown routes, focusing on all day service, to some extent combining routes to create high frequency corridors, minimizing route variations and minimizing deviations on high frequency routes in order to improve reliability and make the network more uh, legible and accessible to people. Public feedback was a really key component of planning the revised bus network. And we have reviewed all of the feedback that we received between May and September, including the feedback that we've received since then as well, because we keep getting more, of course. Um, so we continue to review all that feedback and we've incorporated the feedback into this revised network. As Justin mentioned, there are always trade-offs. We were not able to make every change that was asked of us, but we have designed a new network that is responsive to that feedback. The new bus network, just like as we proposed in May, would still increase service by 25% across the network. It doubles the number of high-frequency corridors which is a bus every 15 minutes or better, seven days a week from 5 a.m. to 1 a.m. And when we say 15 minutes or better, 
on many of those routes during certain periods of time, like morning or evening rush hour, it would actually be more frequent than that. There are routes today that during rush hour or every four minutes or every eight minutes or every 11 minutes, and the intent is not to make those routes less frequent. The intent is to have 30 corridors across the Boston area where all day, every day, you know on those routes, a bus is gonna come every 15 minutes or more frequent than that. With the goal being that the routes are frequent enough that you don't even have to check a schedule. You know that you can just go to your bus stop and that in less than 15 minutes, you'll be getting on a bus there. We ended up making changes to two thirds of the routes that we had in that May proposal um, due to the public feedback that we got. The changes range from really small changes to the way a bus is routed through a neighborhood to wholesale changes to routes, in some cases, putting routes back the way that they are functioning today or function pre-COVID. Uh, so the changes really run the gambit uh, from one end of that scale to the other. And there were five main reasons why we made changes. The first was to respond to public feedback. The second was to improve access to hospitals, senior centers, and other destinations like grocery stores and shopping centers. The third was to reduce walk distances, um, especially for seniors um, and other riders like people with disabilities or mobility impairments, um, and especially in places with really challenging topography. There are certain parts of the bus network that are really hilly and that can pose a really big challenge for folks trying to access bus service. In some cases, a route may only be a block or two away, but if it's up or down a really steep hill, for many of our riders, that can make that service inaccessible. The fourth reason was to preserve some existing one-seat rides to many destinations. So that's a situation where right now you get on a bus at point A and it takes you directly to point B and you don't have to make any transfers. In this new network, for some trips, there will be situations where folks that have a one seat ride today may have to make a transfer to another service. But based on the feedback that we got on that draft network that we put out in May, we looked at many of those situations and in some cases put some of those one seat rides back to the way they function today based on the feedback that we heard. And the fifth reason for changes was to balance resources and make sure that we stay within the hard limits that we have. There are a maximum number of buses that we can run at any given time. So that's a hard limit that we had to stay within. And then there's the budgeted service amount that we had to stay within as well. And that's still 25% above the amount of service that was provided when I say today. In this case, what I mean is the amount of service that was provided pre-COVID. This slide shows a general summary of many of the changes that we made. Not every route is listed here, but I do want to highlight some. Uh, there are some routes that we restored to their existing routing, either in part or in, in whole. Uh, the 55 is an example of that. So that route is going to continue to do what it does today, as opposed to what we had proposed back in May. Uh, the 47 part of it is in the new network. Uh, that was a route that was not in the May proposal. Part of it's in the new network. It also does some other things in addition to part of what it does today. I also want to mention uh, the 354 is a route that we put back. Um, the T39 is a route that we put back basically to what it does today from JP to Copley and Back Bay. Uh, then there were routes that we rerouted to better provide con better connections to medical facilities senior housing and other destinations, as I mentioned. Um, routes like the eight, uh, the 11 and the 12 were all changed. The 11 will now serve Tufts Medical Center from South Boston um, as it does today. The eight and the 12 were, mod uh, excuse me, the eight and the 12 were modified to better serve Boston Medical Center. And you can see many other routes here that we modified for similar reasons. There were some routes that we added to the new bus network that were not in that May proposal. Um, many of these were 
routes that we added in addition to some of the other changes that were made. The 113 is a brand new route from Chelsea to Somerville that is a one seat ride from uh, Chelsea to Assembly Row. And then there were some routes where we modified the frequency or span of service. So that's how often it runs or what times of day it runs, um, but where we didn't make changes to the route themselves. So the SL2, we had proposed it being peak period only on weekdays. The SL2 will continue to be seven days a week in this new network. And then there were some routes that had been included in the May proposal, but are not in the proposal now due to other changes that we made. So the 20 was a route that had been in the May proposal. We've removed it because we put the 201 and 202 back to the way they are today. So many of these changes are related to one another. And when we go into breakout rooms, the facilitators in those rooms will speak in more detail about these routes, and they will show you maps that allow you to see what the change was from the May proposal to now. Information about the revised bus network is publicly available. The list of changes made to the May network is posted on the project website, along with an interactive map and a static PDF map. There is also an online comment form where folks can submit comments to the project team about the revised network map. An equity analysis of the revised network is underway and will be completed by December. And there'll be a public meeting on the evening of December 8th to present the results of that equity analysis. We anticipate implementation of the new network to take about five years, beginning in 2023. And over that five year period, we intend to make changes to routes incrementally every year until by the fifth year of implementation, the whole network is in place. The MBTA and many transit agencies across the country are facing bus operator shortages at the moment. And as you all know, this is something that we are working to address as we go through the phases of implementation with the intent being that we will increase our operator headcount over this period of time so that by year five, when the whole network is in place, we will have all the operators on board necessary to provide this increased level of service. You can continue to stay informed about this project and the process of implementation by going to the project website. Um, you can share comments through the online feedback form and the link to that is on this slide. You can also um, sign up for updates about the project by email by going to the project website. And now I'll turn it back over to Reagan, who will discuss how the breakout rooms will go. Thank you, Doug. Um, so let me put my spotlight on. Um, so as Doug mentioned, we will be having some presentations and breakout rooms by area to answer your questions about the map. Um, we have them listed here, and I'm going to read them out loud because of the so the interpreters can um, translate them. So breakout room one, which is room one, when you see the breakout rooms listed, um, is Chelsea, East Boston, Everett, Malden, Melrose, Reading, Revere, Stoneham, Wakefield, and Winthrop. Breakout room two is Beverly, Danvers, Lynn, Linfield, Marblehead, Nahant, Peabody, Salem, Saugus, and Swampscott. Breakout room three is Burlington, Medford, Winchester, Woburn. Breakout room four is Arlington, Cambridge, Charlestown, Bedford, Lexington, Somerville. Breakout room five is Boston and Brookline. I will note that this does not include East Boston, Charlestown, Alston, Brighton, or the Neponset area. Breakout room six is Belmont, Needham, Newton, Waltham, Watertown. And breakout room seven is Avon, Braintree, Brockton, 
Canton, Dedham, Hingham, Holbrook, Hull, Milton, Norwood, Quincy, Randolph, Walpole, Westwood, Weymouth, and the Neponset area of Boston. So next slide, please, Doug. So each breakout room will have some, a group leader, a facilitator, and a presenter who will give you a short overview of the sort of the rules for the breakout session and updates on the network since we released the map. They will then answer your questions about the map. If you want to visit more than one breakout room, you can switch between rooms at any point. You will need to leave the room. You'll click the leave room button, come back to this main room before rejoining a different breakout room. So we are supposed to reconvene here at 60 minutes. So Doug, I know that the slide says 7.15, but I think we will reconvene at 7.30. Um, and then we'll have the elected officials speak um, and um, Q&A, the next steps. Um, if you cannot stay for the entire time after the breakout session, you can complete the online comment form. And Amanda has already shared that in the chat here. So with that, Shana, can you pause the recording? All right, welcome back everyone. Uh, thank you very much for participating in the breakout rooms. Uh, we hope that we we're able to answer your questions about the changes that were made from the May proposal to the revised network uh, that we have available for you to review now. Um, I do want to reiterate that you can find more information about the revised network map on the project website. On the website, there is a list of all of the changes that have been made to the proposal um, that we made back in May, as well as a, an interactive map and a static map that show the revised network. Uh, so all of that information is available on the project website. We are also developing materials that describe how this revised network relates to the network that exists today so that folks will be able to go and see what their route will do in the future or what their their chip will be in the future so that information or those materials are being developed uh, they are forthcoming and we will be posting them on the project website as well uh, so that folks will be able to use those to understand the changes that will be made to the network in the future Doug, uh, before we go on, I just want to remind everyone now that we're back in the main session. Thank you, Reagan. I think we can go to the next slide. And I'll turn it back over to Reagan. So before we open the comment and question section to the public, we would like to invite any elected officials in attendance to ask questions or make comments. So I'd ask uh, all the electeds uh, who want to speak tonight to uh, raise their hand. And if those of you, if you're not an elected official, if you could lower your hand until we reach that point in the meeting, um, that would be great. So I do see Representative Connolly. So I am going to unmute you now and you should be able to speak. Let me try it one more time. Can you speak now, Representative Connolly? Trying one more time. Representative Colley, you might be, you should be able to unmute yourself. Hello. There we are. Hello. Sorry, sorry about that. You can hear me. Yes, yes. Welcome. Terrific. Uh, well, thank you for uh, taking me uh, out of turn. And thank you once again uh, for the presentation this evening. Um, I made a number of substantive comments uh, at the meeting a couple of weeks ago, 
certainly uh, I think we recognize many of the improvements uh, from the first iteration. Um, one particular substantive issue that I've heard repeatedly is that under the latest plan, there is some cuts in the 68 bus, um, the duration of that bus. And this is a bus I've worked closely uh, with folks at the T to preserve service. It, it's been targeted for cuts at different points over the past few years. Um, and so we've been grateful to the extent we've preserved service on the 68 bus. And I would ask you, um, very respectively to maintain at the very least the existing service. Frankly, I'd like more service on the 68, um, but at the very least, if we can at least continue with current service, I think that would be important from an equity standpoint. You know, uh, overall Cambridge is a wealthy city, but some of the neighborhoods I represent um, face uh, very elevated levels of poverty. We have some of the most diverse neighborhoods in Cambridge that are served by the 68 bus, uh, places like the Port neighborhood uh, in Wellington, Harrington. Uh, and so this is a route that's very important to connecting residents of the Port in Wellington, Harrington to other vital civic destinations, whether it be uh, the City Hall Annex or uh, the Public Library or CRLS. So uh, that, that's really one of my main focuses. And then finally, I'll just say more briefly, um, in terms of process, and you know, on the one hand, I, I really think all of you working on this are doing the best that you can, so I appreciate it. Nevertheless, uh, it's my understanding that this whole redesign will go before the board of directors for the T on Thursday. Um, and, you know, I think on the face of it, that raises some questions. We know that the public meeting a couple of weeks ago uh, went completely off the rails when numerous residents were unable to enter the meeting uh, due to the capacity of the Zoom. And I think that really speaks to what's going on here. You know, we you literally are redesigning 100 or more bus routes and so there are a lot of moving pieces. And I can say as a state rep, I've come to every meeting I've been able to come to. I've written a nine page letter uh, and I continue to stay engaged. And for me as someone who you know is treating this as my full-time job, it is challenging to keep up with. And so I can only imagine as a member of the public who may be doing this in their free time, how difficult it would be to engage. And so, you know, I, one possibility, and I'll close here and, and yield the floor, I don't want to take up too much time, but one possibility might be specifying uh, a real defined process before a bus route is actually eliminated or before service is cut. And so I'm envisioning perhaps if this current iteration of the draft gets approved, perhaps that approval could be sort of a conditional or a provisional approval and that there would be a bit more public process in the future before there'd be any service cuts and maybe that would involve you know 90 days of notice maybe that would involve an opportunity for any concerned members of the public or elected officials to review those potential cuts before uh, the MBTA board or someone else, because you know we just we don't want to be in a position where three years from now or four years from now we're told, well, you know this change is happening because a few years ago you know a decision was made, and we know how things change. So that would be my final comment: would be just to you know contemplate building in some additional process uh, so that folks aren't you know, freaked out that a decision is being made that they don't understand. So thank you once again, and uh, look forward to uh, the rest of the meeting. Thank you, Representative. Um, I will note, because I think some people may have just joined us, um, that right now we are in the portion of the meeting where we're inviting elected officials in attendance to ask questions or make comments. So if you're not an elected official, I would ask that you lower your hand right now and wait for the 
um, main Q&A section. Um, and if you are an elected official and would like to speak and just joined us, feel free to raise your hand and we can take your comments. Um, I will now turn to represent, oops, Owens, and I will unmute you now and you should be able to speak. Hi, thank you uh, so much uh, for your time. I wanna, uh, first of all, thank you for all the work that you've done and thank you for the revisions. I think uh, from my perspective, uh, a lot of my questions from the draft maps have been have been answered. And I just wanna particularly call out the reinstatement of the 74. I think the Concord Ave service in Cambridge was was a real weak point of the of the previous maps and, and bringing it back to uh, at least uh, present day strength is going to be important, especially as that uh, area uh, increases in population. I, I hope we can continue these conversations. And just along the lines of what um, my colleague uh, Rep Conley said, I hope that this is a you know a conversation and not just a something that's set in in stone. Um, but I, I'm I'm hopeful that through this process it will we will continue these these conversations as we as we go forward. Um, I do want to mention one thing and then I will uh, I'll yield. Um, really, I think we heard a lot about the express bus from Watertown, from Newton, from from Waltham. I really think the express reinstating those express buses is going to be really important, uh, particularly as you know work gets done uh, at Newton Corner, work gets done on I-90. Um, I think we're going to really want to have as many options for people as possible so that we can decrease uh, the amount of single uh, occupancy car trips, uh, you know, from the western suburbs. So, with that, I just want to, you know, put that uh, bit of, uh, of of context in uh, in the public record, and and thank you all for your time. Sorry, I lost my unmute button. Thank you very much for your comment uh, tonight. Um, Representative Ryan, um, I see your hand is raised. I'm going to unmute you now. That's great. Can I do video too? Oh, that's fine. Hi, thank you very much. Thanks for your time and, and for this process. I just, I had asked a question in the breakout room too, and I wasn't sure if it could answer because I was switching over from my computer over to my phone. Uh, but I, I guess the main question I have um, is what is the balance between um, sort of ridership numbers and the, and the uh, quantitative data in the qualitative data and, and, and us telling a story for you the five reasons that you use to change routes. Uh, you know, one was topography. Um, Charleston is built into Bunker Hill, that's the name, the Bunker Hill everything. Um, but yeah, we're, we're taking away a route that serves five elderly homes and they're being told, well, if you wanna to get to downtown Boston, just climb the hill that's 120 feet above sea level. And I know there's at least 200 people rode in to try to take another look at the 92 bus, which will end up being the, I believe the T107 or T101. Um, so I'd just like to know how, how much of a balance do we have between where this process thinks the buses should go and how the residents today currently use them and folks who also don't have um, great access to Zoom and to the internet. I mean, I was going myself to the elderly buildings, the senior center that is served by the 92 and helping people write letters because they, they don't typically use these type of devices. Um, and how do we balance that? And how do we balance it when it's a one neighborhood of 15,000 people, when we're in Zooms with cities of 70,000 people? How much do the municipalities weigh in against 15,000 neighbors who are using me as their advocate? Um, and I also just wanted to add in there too, part of that story is <clears throat> the, the brunt that we bear of this system in Charleston. The bus yard to make all this happen makes Sullivan Square inaccessible for us during the rush hour commute. We don't use as residents Sullivan Square Station. That is used for the surrounding region to get buses and trains to where they need to use them. So, even if the ridership data isn't there, the story of why we need the T in Charleston and the isolation we have, because we have been the transportation nexus for the New England region since the Middlesex Canal was built. And that story I, I think got lost 
when you looked at two third, uh, you looked at all these roots and only fixed two thirds of them and left the, the one root and shots on it that changed did not get looked at. So help me find that balance, please. Thank you, Representative. Um, Melissa is, I don't know if you're, if you wanna respond to that. Certainly, uh, I, I, I wasn't in the uh, Charlestown group, uh, but I'm very familiar with those root changes. Um, and we weren't always able to, to make changes. We did hear from a number of writers who were very interested in preserving that direct connection between Charlestown uh, and Main Street, specifically uh, to downtown Boston and to Chinatown and to a number of other uh, locations where folks are traveling to. Um, in this particular case, uh, with many of the other changes that we were making, for example, we were upgrading uh, both the, the main Charlestown corridors, both of them to high frequency service uh, with service every 15 minutes or better, seven days a week for 20 hours a day. Uh, and also both those lines uh, have a lot better connectivity to red line and orange line and green line. Uh, and there's new mobility. So yes, there are some folks who, uh, to continue going into downtown Boston, would take a transfer to the Orange Line either uh, at Sullivan or at Community College for the proposed T101. Uh, or, you know, if some folks are able to transfer between the T101 and the, the new T7, that might be something that's also an option depending on uh, folks' comfort level. Uh, but with the improvements of high frequency, those transfers should be less onerous than they would be today when service might be every 20 or 30 uh, or even uh, less frequent depending on you know when uh, someone might be traveling say on the weekends sometime and then at the same time uh, we're also looking at the orange line transformation project which is slated to get us uh, you know we're buying new orange line cars uh, and they're making a number of signal upgrades to allow for even better service uh, on the orange line so uh, by the time uh, the Orange Line Transformation Project, I think they're slated to get to about four and a half minute headways. So trains that rush hours that are uh, spaced every four and a half minutes apart, which is much better than uh, what the, the transfer looks like today. So thinking about transfers in the context of the new frequencies uh, and overall there's a lot more service in Charlestown. Uh, it, was, it was tough to be able to say that we could do uh, all the things that we're talking about with better frequency uh, without making uh, some other changes. Uh, so there, there's a lot more service in Charlestown that should unlock the ability to make those transfers better uh, while also giving more direct connections to a lot of other places that uh, today would require transfers. Uh, there's a lot more connectivity between Charlestown and Somerville or Charlestown and Cambridge, places that are very awkward uh, transit connections to get to today. Representative uh, Ryan, I'd also like to, to jump in here to add that um, you brought up some really good points about Sullivan Square being a, a huge barrier for residents in Charlestown. Um, we know that's also the case for Rutherford Ave as well. Um, obviously, you know very well, um, and all the folks in Charlestown know that there have been efforts underway for a very long time to reimagine what Rutherford Ave and Sullivan Square could look like. Uh, MassDOT and the MBTA are obviously engaged in those efforts and those conversations with the city of Boston about reimagining what Rutherford Ave will look like yes. and what Sullivan Square will look like in the future. Mm -hmm. um, I also am working on a project that's looking at uh, the possibility of extending this, the Silver Line uh, from Chelsea into Everett and potentially connecting to the Orange Line with one of the possible connections being Sullivan Square or potentially going down Rutherford Ave from there. So we are engaged in a lot of efforts right now to that seek to address a lot of these issues that you mentioned uh, that are really a, a sort of consequence of the transportation infrastructure that is out there today. So we're continuing to coordinate with those efforts. And in addition to the Orange Line transformation, bus network redesign, um, Sullivan Square reconstruction and the Rutherford Ave redesign reconstruction, I think will help alleviate many of the issues that are experienced by folks today in Charlestown being cut off from a lot of the rest of the region 
um, and impacted by that transportation infrastructure. So I just wanted to to add that to the conversation. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Doug. And thank you. Rosita. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your time right. tonight. Yep, and, and thank you for taking me out of turn. I'll, I'll be here listening. Thank you. Excellent. So I think now, um, if we can go to the next slide, Shana. So I'm going to walk through the instructions tonight for Q&A. Um, oh, I think we have the wrong slide here. So I think we are not going to do a chat questions tonight, and we are only going to do Q&A, verbal Q&A um, for this meeting um, in order to take as many people as possible. So um, if you would like to make a, ask a question tonight, um, please raise your hand. Um, or if you're on the phone, you can hit star nine. If you are speaking Spanish or Mandarin, you can raise your hand to provide your comments and questions verbally for the interpreters to hear and repeat your comments. So when we recognize the name, you'll be unmuted and you may speak. And after you share your comment, we're gonna lower your hand and then you'll be returned to the muted state. Um, I will also note that um, at some point in here, uh, I know that my breakout session had one or two questions that we couldn't answer in the main session. And um, so we will make sure, so we'll get to that, but if there's any other breakout room that had questions um, that we should address in this uh, main part of the session, please let me know that as well. Um, so with that, it looks like James Williamson is first, and James, I'm going to unmute you now. Um, can you hear me? Yes, we can. So first of all, uh, you know, thank you for doing some verbal uh, uh, a piece of this. I think it's always important to be able to have that opportunity. The, the, the chat can be really difficult. Um, on two brief comments on two routes. Um, on the 83, I live it in Jefferson Park, in, uh, out on Rinjav, right across from near the bus turnaround at Como Field. I'm really glad that you restored it to Central Square. I think you've done that for all, sounds like for all the right reasons. I think a lot of people are going to appreciate that who typically don't even know that this meeting is taking place, but it's the heaviest concentration of lower income people by more than double of, of any census tract in Cambridge, and they're going to be adding even more uh, uh, density to that, to, to at least two developments right along Ring the, the The thing about the 83 that I want to mention, and I did bring this up, the, it wasn't really, it either wasn't really understood or it just wasn't explicitly addressed. The thing about the 83, yes, I understand that it doesn't make, it's not going to be able to go to Alewife, but extending it to Fresh Pond would be magnificent. You, you can, you, that 83 can take a left on Alewife Brook Parkway. In fact, they already do when the drivers can't make the turnaround because of a parking situation at the bus turnaround at Como Field. They do that anyway already. They go up to Alewife, take a left, go down to the Fresh Pond Rotary, swing around and come back and start their next trip. So why not in, in, include that, at least some of the some trips each day, so that people can get to the Social Security office, which is on Concord Ave, so that people can do shopping at Fresh Pond, and so there could be connectivity to the routes that were being uh, discussed to Steve Owens and, and others, the 74, the 78. You know, I just think it's a great idea. Uh, people in, in Cambridge uh, staff have have took a, took a look at it, and and were interested. But you know, I think it'd be great. The other thing is the 68. Uh, sort of support what Mike Conley said, but but add that it's not just to extend it to eight o'clock, but extend it. The, the main branch of the Cambridge Public Library is a magnificent library. It's extremely popular. Lots of people use it. And the 68 is really great um, to get from there east. You know, you can take the 69 to Harvard Square if you're elder, you're older and don't like to walk all the way to Harvard Square. But to be able to take the 68 in the other direction has proven great in my experience in the past, but only until six or whenever it used to run until. And if that could be, if you could look at at some point after Monday through Thursday, that library closes at nine and have the last trip eastbound to Kendall be something like, you know, 920 or something. I think that would be something really worth looking at. And I think a lot of people would really welcome that and 
thank you for your participation and your work on this. Thank you so much. I don't know, Melissa, if you have anything you want to add to that. No, I think uh, that that stands alone, and we have a lot of folks with their hands raised. So I want to give okay. more people a chance to talk. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, I do actually, I'm going to ask Shana, can you go to the next slide? Um, I want to make sure that we everyone has the links on the hand and I want to note that we're taking all the comments verbally tonight, not through the chat or through direct messaging. Um, I Before we get to the next verbal comments, I do want to address some of the questions that didn't get answered in breakout sessions. Um, Melissa, I understand that in breakout session three, there were some questions about implementation and communications around that. I don't know, Justin, if you want to uh, speak to that at all for the group? Sure, I can speak to that. Um, while I can't commit to specifics at this point, I can talk about um, my philosophy and goals um, with the project as we move from planning into implementation. Uh, first of all, the reason the implementation phase um, for this project is so long, um, in addition to being dependent on capital changes, like infrastructure changes on the street that need to, need to occur, um, it's for communication to customers. This network is a big change and change is hard. And we owe it to ourselves uh, as MBTA staff and to riders um, to slow down and make sure that everyone knows uh, what's happening uh, to, their, to their bus because uh, it's, it's extremely important to, to folks. I, I know myself as a writer myself. Um, we have some delaying the groundwork for our communication strategy right now. We are um, surveying writers, uh, holding focus groups, et cetera, to understand um, how folks get information about their bus changing now, how they would like to get it if it's different from how it is now. Um, and what the MBTA is doing well and what the MBTA is not doing so well about communicating um, bus service changes um, now. We have a process by which we change bus service today. Um, this will follow in the similar footsteps to that process, um, but with much more. Um, that's all I'll say, thanks. Thank you, Justin. I lost my controls again. Um, and then I know in breakout room one, there was a question about the 99 and Savin Street and access to the hospital there. Um, I don't know. I think, Rob, you might be able to answer that question for us. Sure. I'm happy to try and answer the question. So the question was, does the 99 as proposed in this uh, new proposal serve Savin Street and the hospital? as the 99 does today uh, in the current network. I believe and that's then, correct, yes. Yes, uh, so uh, the answer is no. Uh, we are not proposing to have the 99 uh, serve Savin Street in a direct uh, service to the hospital. Uh, this is because we are trying to get a more direct uh, trip for all the people going back and forth uh, between the portion of, of Woodland Road and then to Malden Center Station, and then with the, the new routing of the 99 uh, down into points of Everett. Um, so trying to get a more direct routing is really the, the primary reason for not having that service go to Sabin Street. I'll also mention that less than a half mile away, um, the T101, uh, the, excuse me, the T96, the T excuse me, um, is high frequency service. Um, that uh, people can walk to um, that uh, provides a, a 15 minutes or better level of service uh, that is not so far away. Thank you for clarifying. All right, I think that addresses all the questions that were lingering from the breakout sessions that we weren't able to address there. So um, Betty Lowe, um, you've been patiently waiting and I'm gonna unmute you now. You should be able to speak. Um, hi, thanks for this uh, opportunity to speak. Um, I just wanted to um, kind of tack on to what the representatives, the state representatives who were present at the meeting were saying, because um, it was um, honestly a little, little shocking to me. Um, 
to hear from Representative Connolly that even as elected officials who follow, um, you know, issues um, among which is transit, um, it's a struggle. It's been a struggle for them to keep up. You know, um, I try to keep up with these meetings myself. Um, I um, have people in my network who rely on public transit. Um, and so, you know, given that the board meeting to finalize this design um, or to approve this design for the implementation phase happens this Thursday, you know, is it the case that whoever gets shut out of these Zoom calls gets shut out? Um, you know, there's been, and to follow up on that, um, you know, the answers that I've heard um, from this whole series of meetings so far is, are have been very quantitative, very data driven. You know, um, you know, you'll get bus service four four and a half minutes apart, fifteen minutes apart. Um, it's very exact, which you know that supports bus service. But then you're missing a lot of the qualitative aspects of it. You know, to Representative Ryan's point, he serves a district with uh, five elderly homes. Um, you know, how are they supposed to get service, which I, I, I didn't actually hear, I don't think I heard that addressed in um, the replies from Melissa and I believe it was Doug. Um, so I guess, you know, I, I, I'm concerned about the accountability, um, it seems, from this project, um, you know, the level of outreach and just the over-reliance um, on quantitative data rather than the qualitative experience for riders. Um, and this last point is more of a comment or suggestion for any future changes that might make that might be made. But you know, having these meetings on Zoom it does shut out a lot of people. Um, you know, and there was another the previous speaker um, he mentioned that for folks in Cambridge um, there are lots of folks that can't make it to these meetings. You have the interpreters, but then you know, again there are people that are just not online. Um, I, I would suggest canvassing. You know, you have folks on your team. Um, I believe uh, Marley is like me, living on the South Shore. Um, she mentioned using one of the bus routes. Um, and so I think canvassing and talking to people who actually ride these bus routes um, and doing outreach that way, you know, that would have been, that would have been taken longer. It probably wouldn't have been, you know, as nearly as convenient as just looking at data. Um, looking at things quantitatively, but it would have provided a fuller, more qualitative picture of how important these bus routes are for pe for people and why. You know, you would really get to hear the stories behind why these bus routes are important for people. So, thank you for your time. Thank you very much for your comment. Um, I did want to, to clarify some things. I didn't include the information in this presentation, um, but I did include it in in previous meetings about the public outreach process that we conducted this summer. So. I do want to make a few notes here that we did not rely exclusively on virtual outreach or Zoom meetings. We did a, a really massive amount of in-person outreach. Uh, we had teams of folks from the MBTA, multilingual staff, uh, going to bus stops, transit stations, and talking to riders in person one-on-one, -on -one, distributing printed material to folks, uh, we also met in person with many community-based organizations uh, that helped convene um, their members and their communities and actually invited us to come to speak with them. And we provided interpretation services at a lot of those meetings for folks who um, don't speak English so that they can learn about the changes that we made or proposed the Outreach materials that we produced for this process were published in nine different languages, and we brought them to events you know, all over the bus network. We also ran audio announcements on all of the buses in the system so that folks who um, didn't necessarily find out about this either online or through ads or other means, if they were riding a bus, they would periodically hear an audio announcement on the bus saying the MBTA is conducting a process to redesign the bus network. They want to know what you think. Here's the project website. Please engage in the process. We know that technology is sometimes a barrier for uh, engaging in a process like this. So we made sure that all of our outreach was a combination of in-person and online so that we could reach as many people as we possibly could. 
Uh, we ended up receiving over 20,000 comments on our May proposal for the bus network. And I think that's a testament to how much outreach we did across all of those events, both online and in person. So you mentioned canvassing. That's certainly something that we did as part of this process because we wanted to get the information out to as many people as we possibly could. Um, obviously, we know that we did not reach everyone that we, we wanted to. There were people who found out about this process later than we would have liked. Um, we did our very best to get the information out to as many people as we possibly could and create as many different ways for folks to engage in this process as we possibly could because we wanted it to be equitable and accessible to everyone. Um, but to that point, we still know that there's folks who who are still finding out about the process now. Um, that's part of the reason why we added these extra virtual public meetings, um, why we've posted translated information online um, on the project website. So the, the list of changes that we made from the May map to now has also been translated into nine different languages. And um, we are distributing it to our, our partners and our stakeholders and trying to share this information as much and as widely as we possibly can, because we want as many people to engage in this process as possible. As Justin said earlier, like we cannot do this process by ourselves. We need the help of our bus riders and the communities that we serve to really make this a better bus network. So um, we conducted a really extensive process over the summer, um, and we know that there's still more work to be done. There's still folks out there who don't know about this yet and need to hear about it and learn about it from us and have opportunities to engage in it. So we are gonna have continuous outreach as we go through implementation about changes that will be made to the network. So we, we don't wanna leave anybody out of this process or leave anybody in the dark, um, but thank you for your comment and for pointing out you know, where we could have done better. So we appreciate it. Thank you, Doug. Um, I will also note, uh, just for, I know we're going to keep going and answering questions, but um, for people who do need to drop off at any point, um, there there has been some interest in um, when uh, information from this meeting can be available. And I do want to say that the presentations, we will, the recording of tonight, we'll try to get online as soon as possible. But the recording from the presentations on November uh, second, which were actually a longer presentation than tonight, are already online, um, and you can access that material, and you can even see the presentations um, by uh, region or area. So I wanted to just make a plug that that information is already online. Um, so I will actually note that I think there is a city councilor and elected official who I did not uh, address earlier with the earlier uh, elected. So I'm gonna call on them now. Um, I think it's Medford city councilor, Zach Bears. Uh, my apologies, councilor, um, you should be able to speak now. Thank you so much. Um, I actually was in other meetings, so I was popping in and out. Um, well, thank you for recognizing me. Um, and, and thanks for the detailed presentations that have been made. I just had a, a two questions. Um, you know, we, in, in Medford, there was a lot of community grassroots outreach to, uh, you know, by residents to residents to get comments into you. Um, and I do note that there were changes made to the plan that address some of those concerns. Um, and, and I guess my two questions are this one, um, is there, and it may have been addressed earlier, and I apologize for that, is there any plan to make any further revisions to the map at this time based on public comments received since the revised draft went out? And then secondly, um, since this is going to be implemented in phases over multiple years, is it possible that there may be future, future opportunities for public input, um, given that there may be additional resources put towards this project or uh, changes that come up in the meantime? You know, we just have a lot of growth and change in our community. Um, and I don't want to see parts of our community that may be, you know, much more, may have much higher ridership in two or three or four years uh, left out because the ridership wasn't there today. So those are my two questions. Thank you. 
Thank you, Councillor, very much for your questions. Um, I will say that the revised network map that we presented today and, and that is available on the project website is what we intend to bring to the Board of Directors for their approval. Uh, but to your second point, uh, with a five-year implementation timeline, we know that over the course of that period, circumstances may change, um, the conditions on streets may change, and we do anticipate that that may have an influence on the bus network and that we may need to make changes to the proposal in response to changing conditions on the ground over that period of time. Um, a really good example of that is that right now there are many communities in the bus network that have ongoing planning processes or road reconstruction projects that will have an impact on the bus network. So we're continuing to work with all the municipalities in the bus service area um, to understand what the implications of any ongoing or future projects may be and how that may need to be incorporated into the future bus network as we go through implementation. Uh, there are actually some planning efforts underway um, that we have initiated as well uh, that may also influence the bus network. So it is possible that in the future um, we may make minor modifications to routing that we've shown in this map in response to some of those on-road conditions. I think a good example of that is if we're showing service on a uh, particular street today um, and say the city of Boston is a partner that we work with a lot around transit priority and we're showing certain routing for certain routes like the T7 through downtown, the city of Boston has an ongoing planning effort to figure out um, an ideal corridor from North Station to South Station for transit priority bus lanes continuously between those two points. So we're showing a particular routing for the T7 through downtown right now, but if the city of Boston through their planning effort and in coordination with us decides that the ideal corridor for transit priority is slightly different than what we're showing on our map, we will respond to that by working with them to adjust what we ultimately implement there. So we're continuing to have conversations with municipalities. We know that we are going to have to work very closely with all of our municipal partners and with communities and neighborhoods throughout this process um, as we go through implementation. So uh, the, the short answer to your second question is yes, there um, are situations like that that will ultimately influence the final layout, so to speak, of the bus network. Thanks, Doug. So uh, Robin Forrest, I'm going to unmute you now. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. The, the 441 route is very critical to me. It's the bus that I take going to and from work. It's the bus I take going to several doctor's offices on along Paradise Road in Swampskit. And it's also the bus I take if I need to go shopping in Vinon Square. I don't drive, I don't have a car. I've submitted several um, surveys to indicate this. I have never received a response, just, you know, we got your submission. Um, to me, adding service to the 442 route is not gonna help me because I use the 441 route walking three times the distance to get to the 442 route uphill carrying a laptop and a purse in the summer in the winter when there's snow and ice i'm not going to chance falling uphill or going downhill to get to uh new ocean street it's just i don't think it makes any sense you're, you're taking away from some people and you're giving um you're giving some people the bus lottery and you're giving them more service and you're taking away service and creating extreme hardship for other people. I mean, all the workers that are, you know, are in Vinton Square too, and take that bus to get, you know, to Lewis Street. Now they're going to have to go all the way to Lynn and then take another bus to get to Lewis Street. It's just, you, 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 I, I don't think there's someone thinking, you know, this little change that we're going to make you walk three times the distance, which is not really 
flat surface walking three times the distance, you know, and there's no, there's no shelter anywhere to, you know, or for a bus stop. So, you, you know, you can't stand out there for a, a longer period of time. So you have to leave earlier is helpful. To me, I would just really like you to reconsider, please keep the 441 route. You're cutting off all access to Paradise Road in Swampskit. So I can't get to, to and from work. I can't get to the doctor's offices. There's several doctor's offices and I can't get to shopping. So it's like it's like you're rewarding Humphrey Street in Swampskit and Marblehead and you're taking away from you know the area I need. I just really wish you'd please just reconsider this. Because I, th I think you could just keep the 441 and the 442 as is and things work fine. I don't see the 442 route, you know, being overly crowded when I'm waiting for, for the 441 down Central Square because I'm taking the 440, you know, one to the 442 doesn't seem to be overcrowded because, you know, we're splitting up going two different directions. So I would just really like you to reconsider that. Thank you. Thank you very much for your comments. Um, I'm going to now turn to Sasha Merstein. Yes, hi. So I will just read what I wrote um, as I've been trying to express it on multiple occasions. Brighton is being ignored on all fronts. You could have stretched the 64 out to Oak Square and you just forgot that all along uh, dropping the high frequency T12 proposal. That was a good idea. That would have helped Brighton. But now we are cut from the Longwood medical area and it seems we'll just walk uh, from Canmore via the 57 that was ostensibly improved yet is really maintaining the level of service that it has. Thank God for that. Um, but so walk from Canmore uh, or simply avoid the LMA as um, we've, uh, I, I won't get into specifics, but some have switched hospitals to not go there. And I know the doctors that uh, uh, live nearby uh, aren't able to access it easily. So why would they even consider it? The 65 is effectively useless. Uh, stretching to Oak Square would have made sense. And yet the route was split. Why was it split? If you're going to have a, an 85 minute ride uh, that's 10 miles long that your bus drivers are complaining about, I do understand, but uh, at least maybe stretch the 65 to Oak Square to tap in a greater population and give it access to the Longwood medical area that it really doesn't have or use now. Um, then the least that you could have done with a shortened crosstown route uh, with the 86 that no longer will access Somerville on a one seat ride was to keep the 10 to 20 minutes weekday service to Harvard Square. Um, that's uh, as far as I can tell being cut back. And this was not clearly noted anywhere. It's being presented as a positive. Uh, but the reality is we all know the 86 is one of the least reliable buses in the system. There are many problems for it. I understand that I've been riding it for decades. Um, but now that I uh, find myself uh, in my first home in this community, uh, having invested in it because the 86 is here, it is so disheartening to see it go. It disconnects me from my mother. Uh, she walks rather than use it. And it also uh, disconnects me from uh, work meetings in Somerville. And honestly, I'd rather uh, not go anywhere and, and uh, um, continue to keep disconnected from um, the part that used to be, uh, that our community used to be a part of. Little Cambridge is what Brighton was until 1874. Um, but now, okay, this is where we are. Um, that, so with that said, you're not making the bus usable. This isn't equity. Um, Brighton's population grew nearly 9% in the 20 tons. It hasn't changed um, since the 501 was introduced in the 70s either, yet you find it wise to cut the 501. Downtown revitalization possible from the historic linkages to Brighton in decades past is being cemented dead by this progress. And uh, I know Justin said earlier that uh, 
uh, your, your uh, oh man, I can't read my own notes here, but uh, essentially you are looking to increase service. Service isn't being increased, right? And it's been decreased. And um, it's disheartening. And I would hope that you reconsider it wherever possible. I understand you need to find balance and I appreciate what you've um, done um, over the many months. I hope that you can find a way to keep Brighton included, stretch the 65 to Oak Square and ensure high frequency on the 86 route, whether it's connected to the T109 or otherwise. Thank you. Thank you for your comments tonight. I'm gonna to turn to Anita uh, Lichtbau. I'm gonna unmute you, Anita. Um, thank you for taking um, time to listen to my uh, comment and question. And I um, wanna thank everyone. First, I know this has been a very complicated project and I'm sure you're trying to do the best for everyone. I wanna talk about the Newton Express buses. I have ridden the 553, 554 for decades. Um, I get on at Washington Street in, in West Newton. Um, I don't understand why the MBTA is basically decimating the entire express bus system. This is not just taking one bus out or two buses out or three buses out. It's taking four buses out as express buses. And those buses were full during rush hour. I, read, I rode them for years and years and years. They were full. What I hear now in the, in the, um, in the breakout meeting was that, well, we reduced it because the ridership was down after COVID. Well, of course the ridership was down after COVID because you took out the express buses. So now what people are doing is either driving to work or not going downtown at all. And I just don't understand why you would want a system where people are now increasing traffic, increasing carbon emissions by driving, or just not going into downtown at all. When I thought what we were trying to do was make downtown Boston a viable financial center and a viable place where people wanted to go. Um, so there are several problems with what the plan is. And let me just say this, that I don't see a single improvement to any MBTA service, bus service in Newton, none. They are all deterioration, they are all negatives. And I think that is really a shame. So the problems are the 553, 554, 556, 558, they're all local buses, as you know, and don't go downtown. So what that means effectively is that adds at least half an hour to the commute. And I know that because I have tried to take the 553 and 554 over the past few months. I have gone during rush hour, the height of rush hour, quarter to eight in the morning. I have waited, I would say, between 25 minutes and 40 minutes each time in Newton Corner for the bus to go downtown. There was not a single bus going downtown at quarter to eight in the morning till quarter after eight morning. Um, for, 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 for that period, a single bus going downtown. So the idea that there's going to be more frequent buses is just not happening. Um, and the buses that the 553, 554 used to run every 10 or 15 minutes uh, during rush hour, it now runs, I think, once an hour. And then if you get, then if you make that, you have to wait, as I said, for 25 to 40 minutes for a bus to get downtown that stops in Copley. So you're adding Half an hour, it took me an hour and a half to get to work one day using the express bus that used to take me 35 to 40 minutes. So it's not surprising that you're not seeing uh, the ridership bounce back because people are not willing to do that. And if they can work from home, they will. If they can drive, they will. And so that's what's happening. And I see that as a, um, a large problem. And I don't understand why we are not trying to encourage people taking public transportation and people going back downtown. I understand there's always resource concerns and I totally support the idea of having an equitable bus system and making sure that people who have no other options and need the bus to get wherever they need to go should certainly have that service. But I don't see why it has to be an either or. We just passed, the state just passed a millionaire's tax where the money is supposed to go for public transportation. We have a climate crisis where we want to decrease the amount of carbon emissions. This just makes no sense to me whatsoever. And I also want to say, and I think that um, our elected representatives have also said this, that there is there are hundreds of units of housing that are going up along Washington Street 
um, in Newton, many of them affordable housing, the armory, I was on the, the citizens um, committee for that, and the city decided to buy that building, there's gonna be, I don't remember exactly how many, but something like 50, 60 units of affordable housing next door. There are gonna be 400 units of housing that are gonna be built very soon. Um, and the north side of Newton is not, it's not the wealthy side of Newton, put it that way. Okay, there's many low income families that live um, within walking distance of that area and they won't be able to walk. So I just wanna, ask you to reconsider and, and I do want to ask you I'd like an answer as to why have you just why are you destroying the Newton Express bus system I still haven't really heard an answer for that so I would like an answer for that thank you um thank you for your comments thank you for oh I have a little bit of an echo um so I'm going to turn it to uh Terry uh Alther Terry I'm going to unmute you Oh uh, yeah, thank you very much. Um, I just want to say that I strongly echo the comments um, of my fellow Newton resident who just spoke, as with um, the other elected officials from Newton, uh, to support more express bus services. While I fortunately do live near the 505, I will say during midday when there's no 505 service and when the commuter rail only goes one day, I will say back when the 553, 554 went downtown, that was extremely uh, beneficial during midday when I had to do a downtown trip. Um, I do want to say, uh, going off that, I do think that, you know, there's definitely like concerns I have about the plan overall. I do think there's a very strong austerity mindset to it. So as a result, there's very much a lot of communities are pitted against each other. Obviously, I think that the recent revision, I think for the most part, I think was much more beneficial for certain communities, including Newton. Although I will say that um, some changes such as um, having the 52 um, be a weekday only route and then having the 59 still do that deviation through um, Adam Street instead of just keeping the current alignment do baffle me a little bit. And, and I know especially my friends in Newton, uh, Newton Center are disappointed to learn that the 60 will not be extended to uh, Newton Center after all. I will say I do think that there's um, a lot of I think there's a lot of considerations that haven't been considered in this proposal. Most uh, first of which is obviously um, you know the new uh, projects to uh, repair and improve I-90. So especially while that's going on, I think it's vital to ensure we have as many express buses as possible. I even know that there's been people advocating to have you know HOV lanes precisely for that purpose in on I-90. For the buses to easily get through and through traffic as well. Um, I've written the 505 recently during rush hour traffic heading into Boston uh, in the evening. And the fact that it was super crowded, you know, pretty much, you know, makes the case on its own, especially since most of the rush hour traffic is heading um, westbound. So, um, but yeah, um, I also uh, strongly believe that um, with the uh, current with the this new plan, um, I think it's vital to work with other transit agencies. Um, while I'm pleased to know that the uh, 53 will be an option to um, ride um, heading into um, uh, where was yeah heading into um, that area of uh, like Western Waltham, especially in Market Basket, which I which I sometimes go to. Uh, I will say that um, I wish there was a way to ensure that uh, with the 53 that we could do connections with the one and the eight of um, Metro West Regional Transit Agency, because sometimes I do have to head out um, to uh, westwards and especially in the morning on weekdays, that's extremely difficult because of the fact that um, the commuter rail trains in West Newton are only going into Boston and not, and there's very few outbound trains that even stop at Boston, if at all. Uh, I will um, also note that um, I do think that if there's a way to um, better coordinate this with officials, I think it's useful because I know there's certain um, comments that were made um, throughout this presentation that if there are people who are unhappy with the changes, they should um, talk to their elected officials, which I think I definitely will do. Um, I also, you know, I think that it'd be really useful because I think especially with like the uh, change on Adam Street for the 59, uh, I think that it would be, if it's really that much traffic, I think it'd be very useful to at least like have a bus route that goes from uh, Newton Corner through Adam Street to maybe at the very least like near that area where BJ's is at. Because I know like there are a lot of people who shop in that area, whether it be Shaw's, oh. BJ's yeah. or um, Stop and Shop as well. So I, I think right. those, 
should definitely be considered. And yeah, uh, I hope that if there's if the issue is a funding issue or if it's you know bus shortage issue, that this gets a um this is the MBTA makes specific requests to the state legislature because I think with the current trends um going on, I think those requests will be right. All right. I think you you kind of I think you were finishing um even though it cut out at the end. So thank you for your comment. Um I will make a a I know there's a lot of people who still uh, want to speak tonight. So um, I would urge everyone, if you could keep your comments um, relatively brief, um, that would be helpful so we can hear from as many people as possible. So um, I have Daniel uh, next, and I'm going to unmute Daniel. Hi. Um, can you hear me? Yes, you're all set. Perfect. Um, thank you guys so much for everything you've been doing with the with the buses and the changes and everything. Um, I had two, well, one comment and one question. My first question um, was about after this is proposed to the board and then they give feedback and such, will there be any other rounds of, of feedback or opportunities for the public to give their input? Or is it just that is if approved, what is going to be instated over the next several years? So I was wondering if that could be answered. Thank you, Daniel, for your question. This is a sort of similar question to the one we got from the Medi Medford City Councilor earlier. Um, there, when we go to implement, go through the phases of implementation, we will be looking at the conditions that exist on the ground, how it's compared to what existed when we made this proposal, and if we need to make any modifications to. Um, the network has proposed based on those changes. Um, and part of that will be folks submitting comments to us with their thoughts on implementation. We have an online feedback form uh, open now that folks can submit comments to, um, to the implementation team. So we are continuously receiving feedback from folks um, and we'll continue to receive feedback from folks as we go through that implementation process. Um, I can't make promises about any particular changes to the network, um, but I can say, you know, realistically, we know that over a five-year implementation timeline, some circumstances will change over that period that have implications for what we ultimately implement um, and what the network finally looks like at that year five mark. So we will continue to accept comments from folks um, and there'll be continuous communications about this process as it moves forward. Great, thank you. And then um, the other thing I wanted to bring up was kind of echo what partially what was mentioned earlier about the 83 bus specifically, um, that I live between Inman and Porter and that's a great bus going to Central. Um, but I was also really happy to see that the bus was potentially gonna be going to Kendall also. And I was wondering if there are ever any routes that like or that the, the, you guys would ever consider implementing something such that like the bus went from Central to Ringe and then Ringe to Kendall, then Kendall back to Ringe and kind of did an alternating three thing. I know that could be confusing if we're the same number bus, but just an idea there, um, just because I have found it quite difficult to get to Kendall kind of from that um, area between Porter and Inman Square. Um, especially with like the new proposal of the 85 that would come only every hour every hour or so so taking the 83 there just would result in about like 15 20 minutes of walking or waiting up to an hour for a bus so just wanted to throw that out there as something else but thank you guys for all of your input and stuff thank you for your suggestions as well daniel um i'm going to now turn to katie p i'm going to unmute you katie hi yes thank you um First, I wanted to say I appreciate the revisions that you made to the T96 route. Um, I currently live in Medford Hillside neighborhood, and I find that even with that revision to serve the Winthrop Street part of that route, um, our neighborhood has had a lot of service taken away from it, and there's, there's a pretty gaping hole in the map in terms of Medford Hillside, Western Somerville, West Medford. Um, and I think a big concern about this is that a lot of my neighbors do not have cars and because we've had previous multiple reliable bus service to get us specifically to Davis Square and to Arlington Center um, and to West Medford and especially along Boston Avenue. 
um, I think there's a concern because when we were in the breakout rooms, the answer to a question about this was, oh, you can take the 80, which I appreciate you having reinstated. However, the 80s route is now incredibly long going all the way out to Burlington Mall, which will cause a lot of traffic and probably a lot of delays if we're realistic because of going out there. And then it's only every 30 minutes in rush hour and every 60 or to 90 minutes in off hours. Yet that's the only route that's serving this entire neighborhood all the way to Davis Square. And so that is a little troublesome when you're when we're told that's the route that we have to rely on for that. And in particular, I have a lot of neighbors who are senior citizens and live in the affordable housing at Walk Walkling Court. And that is the, um, the only bus that would be serving that neighborhood currently with the new route. And, you know, I feel like that's an, um, an unfair access for them and for our entire neighborhood. Um, so I would really hope that you would at least consider increasing the frequency of the 80 because that's a really, really important route, incredibly important. All my neighbors take it all the time. And I think the answer in the breakouts that was saying, oh, we will just have to, once it's instated, then maybe it'll be increased based on ridership. But when it's only that infrequent, riders don't take it. That's I think that's the issue is that if you have to wait 30 minutes for a bus that may or may not be late because it's coming all the way from Burlington, you might try to find some alternate route, which would be way more expensive, like taking an Uber or not. And so I think that's an unreliable way to try to possibly change that route. And perhaps you can consider just increasing that frequency. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Katie. I appreciate your comments tonight. Um, I'm going to go to Gregory uh, Zelt. Gregory, you should be able to speak now. Hello, can you guys hear me? Yes, we can. Yeah, so I brought this up during the um, breakout groups, but I know it was better to ask it during the larger meeting. Um, there is like a change in GM, as I guess I feel like a lot of people know, maybe not everybody knows, but there's an expected change in GM in a couple months for the MBTA. Um, does that affect anything about the Better Bus project, or do we can we expect that the project will stay about the same regardless of who the GM is? I can respond to that. We do not anticipate that having a an impact on this project. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm going to turn to Carl Speth, and I'm going to unmute you, Carl. Hey, can you hear me? I can. Thanks. How you doing? I'm back. I was in room breakout room one. I just got a few quick things to say. First off. Thank you for removing Central Ave from the 108. That hill is indeed way too steep for the bus to go. Secondly, to follow up with those two talking about the express routes from Newton before, and I temporarily switched over to the Lynn breakout room just to discuss that. There weren't very many people there, unfortunately. But it's not just the Newton routes that are being cannibalized, as it were, but the 426 and 450 are no longer going to be expressed either. Kind of wish we canvassed in Lynn a little bit better about that. And I was thinking that we could maybe also kind of like the alternating idea with the 83, have the 426 and 450 alternate during rush hours and have it at Wonderland at all other times as a suitable compromise. And thirdly, a little ex concern I expressed was about the T109 and then 113. Now, I'm, I don't want both routes to be diverted because there are some people who need those stops there. But Alfred Street is like a parking lot. So I really think that one of those two routes should be diverted to go via Wellington or Wellington Circle and Assembly and then Sullivan. And then in the case of the T109, if that's chosen, on to Harvard. That's all I really got to say. But once again, thanks for fixing thanks for fixing the 108. Well, thank you for your comments tonight. I appreciate the suggestions. Um uh Tian Li Lee, uh I'm gonna unmute you. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. Hello. Um I um thank you for holding this meeting and for allowing public comment. Um I wanted to speak about the reduction of service to West Cambridge in particular. Um first of all, 
Um, I don't feel like very many people um, knew about this whole situation because when I when I found about out about it, it was already very late. It was the end of summer, kind of September. And then when I brought it up to people um, in the neighborhood, particularly parents, um, parents of the high school students, it seemed like nobody knew about it. So that's one thing. Um, maybe because you know the kids who take the buses don't you know don't pay attention to this kind of thing. I, I don't really know, but it seemed like not people people were not aware. Um, so the reduction in services, I wanted to talk about how it affects um, the CRLS students, um, the students of the high school, because. Um, they don't have school buses. We do rely on public trans transit for the kids to get to school. Um, and at this point already, um, just from, you know, all the parents have reached out to me, I know that the service um, is already unreliable enough to the point that um, kids don't rely on the public bus to go to school anymore because they they, they wait for the bus and then it doesn't show up and then they're late to school. And so then the next day they're like, mom, drive me or whatever. Uh, and so it becomes very, very hard um, to use it. Um, and, you know, as it becomes even less frequent with the reductions that are coming up in the 78 in particular, um, I worry that people are just going to, you know, kind of drop it from their list of options. I think a, a, a couple of other people brought this up already is that when you have a bus that has service that's running less than, you know, twice an hour, say, um, or, you know, something, you, there aren't buses that are coming to your neighborhood in any kind of regular, you know, every 15 minutes kind of way, then you, you can't really rely on it to get to school on time or to get, you know, home on time to get to your, you know, activity on time. And so it just doesn't even become an option in your brain anymore, um, which is really, really unfortunate because of course we want young people to take public transit and also because Cambridge is really making a push to decrease car traffic. Um, but the only way that we can do this is if we have good, reliable, frequent um, public transit. So um, in particular, I was wondering if you know, if um, MBTA would consider at least extending the peak hours to accommodate kind of students um, instead of, I know the 78 has been reduced um, to only having the peak two, twice an hour is what they consider peak for four to seven um, on weekdays. And maybe if that could be extended from three, you know, starting at three o'clock, so to accommodate the kids and then go maybe till eight, so it accommodates their after, after school activities, that would be really helpful. It's only an hour or two, you know, extended on each side. I think that would make a really big difference to whether, um, whether kids have it in their heads that they can use that service and still get to places on time. Um, and then I just, um, and I just, and then I just wanted to, one specific thing I also wanted to, to ask about is that the, the MBTA used to run um, these kind of special routes in the morning um, from, for example, the 72, which is now the 75, would run a bus from Huron Village down Broadway so that it actually would go right by the high school. And apparently this service was cut sometime in the past few years, definitely not during COVID, it wasn't running and is not running now. And so a lot of parents have wondered and tried to find out what happened to the special route that, you know, could help the kids get to school on time. Um, um, nobody seems to know um, what happened to it. Um, nobody has been able to contact anybody at MUTA to find out what happened to it and to ask if it could be reinstated because it would be really, really helpful. Um, it doesn't have to, you know, be a frequent thing. It could just be one bus, you know, at the 801 um, that would run down there and get the kids to school on time. So I'm just wondering, um, I'm just hopeful that the MBATA can be open to such, you know, kind of specific situations that would really, really help a lot of people out, um, specific, specifically our young people um, in Cambridge. Thank you so much for your comments um, and suggestions. I mean, I think, um, you know, we're taking, as Doug said, we're listening to comments tonight and through the feedback form as we move forward. Um, I'm going to now unmute Casey Connors. Casey, you should be able to speak. Um, uh, thank you so much. Um, for doing the presentation. It's really helpful and I know very confusing. Um, I have some um, comments on questions about Arlington, but also on equity, and I think they relate. Um, Arlington has ha always had a problem um, with the 87 bus, that it's coming every hour, but it um, the large 
Arlington Food Bank, um, I think next week that serves like 700 people is moving to Broadway and that's the only bus. And it, to come every hour to a shelter or a bench there, or even in Arlington Center, this is a huge problem. So many people are um, disabled, elderly. Um, and the, the 87 bus also goes to Monot Monotony Manor, which by, that's the only one, that is the um, another very large uh, lower income housing place. And how can, hello? Yes, um, yes, yeah. I can hear you. Sorry, um, how, how can we ensure, I know that there are churches that work with this um, lower income, large lower income housing area. So should we contact them to be able to help you? How can we help you uh, know which areas um, are where the people do actually need um, bus service and are, are in such need? Um, I'm not sure how, how your procedure is done, how you um, uh, how, how you uh, come up with the, those um, ideas. Um, as uh, someone else said, I think uh, James Wilson that Fresh Ponds also has Mass Hire, which is the unemployment and training center, and it's very difficult for um, elderly, for disabled people to get there now. So a bus there would be great. Um, also, like for instance, seniors, women, and children, they ride buses. Their patterns are completely different than than commuters. And things like safety are so important. Bus shelters and benches are so important. So how is this done, and how can we help you on that? For instance, um, for Assembly Square, the number ninety. Usually, in other areas, the developer is required to um, build the bus stop and um, shelter and benches. Is that not a possibility? Could we ask? Or is that just not done in the whole MBA center? Um, so again, as I see it, when I, I'm just temporarily disabled riding the bus, people give up when they realize the bus is not coming every hour. They give up, they take Uber, or um, especially as you understand, seniors stay in, they don't go out. Um, lower income people do not go to the doctor, which they need to. Um, they don't go out, which is really terrible for their health. Um, they don't go and get their medicine because the, the transportation isn't working. And as I'm sure you know, um, there are so many poverty alleviation studies that show um, MITs, NYUs, um, tr good transportation is the most important ticket out of poverty. So how can we help you to make sure um, that these people that fall under this equity category um, know about the bus and you know about them. I was so impressed with Rep um, Dan Ryan going and signing people up. Um, what else can you suggest that we can help you and our communities to make sure you know what's not working? Um, because it's, to me, listening, uh, it sounds like everyone here on this Zoom has a college education. And when I ride the bus, I don't think the times off hours, the buses I ride, almost nobody does. Uh, and I do chat. Um, thank you. So, so yes, yeah, so thank you for your very thoughtful comments tonight and suggestions. And I know that the T will continue to work with groups to um, assist the riders. Um, and um, I am, though, conscious of time and the number of uh, people who still want to make comments and ask questions. Um, so I will, uh, we will take your suggestions and thank you for those comments. Um, I'm going to unmute Eugene Benson and Eugene, you should be able to speak now. Thank you. Um, I appreciate the presentations tonight and the opportunity to comment. I'm a member of the Arlington Redevelopment Board, which is both the planning board and the redevelopment authority for Arlington. And I'm also an Arlington elected town meeting member representing Precinct 10. Precinct 10 is on both sides of Pleasant Street, Route 60, 
the southern, approximately the southern half of it in Arlington, as well as bordering um, Route 2 from approximately a little bit east of um, Route 60 to about halfway up the hill to um, Park Avenue. Um, I, I guess I should start by saying that I am very disappointed that you are presenting this plan to the board on Thursday and not taking into account and making any adjustments based upon the public comments that you've received recently and that you are receiving tonight. I would ask you to tell the board that you've gotten a lot of public comments and you'd like some extra time to uh, consider them and aren't ready to make uh, a presentation for approval to the board. It's the first thing. Second, I'd like to thank Ms. Connors for raising some issues about Broadway in Arlington, which is one of our major corridors. And it, it is important that the bus routes along Broadway are sustained. We expect there will be more development happening along Broadway fairly recently. We also had a design competition for some redesign along Broadway. So it's essential that the buses along Broadway um, work. I do want to be critical to some of the changes made for Arlington because this proposal eliminates completely two bus routes in Arlington. The 79, which went from Arlington Heights along Mass Ave to Alewife, and the 84, which went from Arlington Heights along Route 2 to Alewife. In other words, you've eliminated two of the buses that went from Arlington to Alewife Station. I appreciate that you reinstated the 67 bus. It was essential that you do that. And it's almost a substitute for the 67 because you now have it going down Mass Ave and onto Elwife. However, it's not a great substitute because it misses the western half of Mass Ave where we have senior assisted living and plus there's now a 40B proposal, all of which will not have access to Elwife because there's no longer a bus going from Arlington Heights um, to Elwife. Second, oh. I'm, I'm very concerned about the lack of any one seat ride from Pleasant Street. These are my constituents. It's the bus I've taken for 30 years, one seat ride to Elwife. I was actually fairly concerned that the comment during the breakout, well, you can take the 54 and transfer at one end or the other, but the 54 only runs once an hour. It is really not realistic to ask somebody to take the 54 bus that runs once an hour to go a half mile and then to wait for another bus that only runs once every half hour. I think you need to find a way to reinstate a bus that goes down Pleasant Street and goes to Elwife. If you insist on having the 54 being that bus route, I'd suggest Route the 54, so it goes along Route 2 as the 67 did to Elwife, then swings back down Elwife Brook Parkway, makes a right turn on Concord Avenue, goes into Belmont that way, and then continues on the route. That would accomplish a couple really important things. Number one, it's, it would I, provide access to Elwife for a part of Arlington that's had access for 30 years on a one seat ride, which you're going to eliminate. And secondly, it would provide a one seat ride for people in Belmont to Elwife, and they currently don't have one. So um, thank you for allowing me to thank make you. those comments. Thank you for your suggestions and comments. Um, I will note that we're approaching nine o'clock and I know that um, our interpreters um, do need to stop them. We have three more commenters with their hands raised. I would like to hit all three. And so we can give everyone a chance to make comments, but would ask um, if possible to keep your remarks brief so we can hear from everybody. So we'll hear from Rich, Susan, and Debbie tonight, and then 
Um, and I will just urge people that if they have other comments to make, please submit it through the form and Amanda can share that again in the chat. So Rich, I'm gonna unmute you now. Hi, so I live in Medford and I feel like there's a gaping hole with the 94 bus gone. I'm be right on High Street, but I'm you know, somewhere between Boston Ave and Winthrop. And that bus provided me with direct access to the red line so that I could get to Mass General. It also provided me with access to City Hall and the Senior Center. Um, Medford Square also services a lot. Of, there's a lot of senior housing in Medford Square. So my concern is how are those people going to be able to get to their doctor's appointments? There are they, a lot of home health aides also service those seniors. And a lot of them take public transportation and not having that line, um, I think would greatly hinder their ability to, to get there. Um, we also talk about the connections, you know, possibly I could make a connection, um, take the bus, the, the 95 and try to get the 80 bus, then that would take me to Davis. Um, and then this is just a side thing too, but you know, we do have transfers and the transfers you can't use them on taking two buses and then the train. Right now, if I take a bus and I go to Davis, I can hop on the red line, I get a transit. Um, but how does that, how is that all going to work? Especially since now we're going to have to make more, uh, more connections. And how do we get to City Hall? How do we get to the senior center? I mean, if we take the 95 bus to Medford Square, it still doesn't take you directly to City Hall or the Senior Center. You're going to have to make another connection. That's just, it's a lot. It's a lot for older people to do, especially when it's freezing out and there's, you know, you're out there in the cold and the ice. So how would that work? Thank you. Thank you so much for your comments. Um, I'm gonna to turn to Susan and then Debbie and then Doug, I'll let you wrap up for the evening. So Susan, I'm gonna unmute you now. Hi, um, thank you um, for um, having these forums and um, I'm glad to be part of it. Um, I um, am looking forward to the 54. I was um, pretty excited. Um, to see that posted last spring. Um, I wasn't in the first um, information session that you held. Um, I did review everything on your YouTube um, videos and went back and um, heard the previous presentations that you had and the chats. Um, and I guess, from the first uh, submission of this of the route, it had been altered. Um, and so my suggestions or the comments or things that are standing out to me in listening this evening is it seems as though there's um, the same kind of commentary that I keep hearing and it's um, like the one seat ride or, or longer rides on these buses um, or longer, um, I guess, shifts where um, it's gonna be a 60 minute or even a 30 minute wait between buses is a really long time and a hardship for people. Um, my suggestion is to try to um, connect these buses into currently existing hubs and make these kind of rides or some kind of connections shorter for people so then the buses can be um more frequent i think to get to where we all want to be which is using the transit system um more regularly we need these buses to be in place at least every 15 to 30 minutes i think an hour is is too long um to wait for a bus um, and I just don't think like another person had spoken earlier. Um, I don't think that you're going to get the, I guess the numbers on the bus that you're 
looking for when the buses are only going an hour. So I would recommend looking to see how you can shorten the route and connect the routes to other kind of make, you know, type of power stations uh, where people are kind of getting off and getting on uh, fairly quickly onto something else where they're, you know, continuing on a, you know, on in route. Um, I think the the shorter and uh, the quicker the service uh, for people being able to get on um, is is going to be key here to the success of um, people actually using and and riding the transportation system. Thank you, Susan. I appreciate your comments. Um, I will take Debbie, and then um, there is one last person, Patrick, with their hand raised. So I think Doug will just take the last two comments, and then you'll do your final remarks. So Debbie, I'm going to unmute you, please. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Hi, so my name is Debbie. I um, live in Somerville. Um, I have two kids that take public transit, so we are on the bus a lot. So I am, you know, I'm grateful that um, the bus, the 89 was reinstated, but it's just, it feels so weird to be at this point where I'm thanking the MBTA for bringing back a service that was already necessary. So I agree with what a lot of folks have said. We have to have, you know, reliable, consistent, local connections. So I would hope that the MBTA really considers what everyone's saying about keeping connections and I agree with um you know when the reliability is not there we, people kind of give up on using public transit and I know that everyone wants to be on public transit so we're behind you we want this to work so I really hope the MBTA really listens to all these comments um the frequency for me personally like the 89 is a big connection for like within the city. So for me, it's, it's important that my kids are on the bus safely. So the 89 at a much better frequency. Like right now, I think it's at 30 minutes. We lost the 80 through Somerville. So I think having the, the 89 at um, a higher frequency and it already has a dedicated bus lane in Somerville. So it feels um, important that the MBTA listens that the city's already made infrastructure changes to accommodate this. So the 89 really should be at a higher frequency. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much for your comments tonight, Debbie. Um, and with the last comment on, of the night, I will turn to Patrick. Patrick, I'm gonna unmute you now. Uh, thank you very much. I promise I'll be brief and I will. Uh, my only comment is something I've mentioned before and it's something you can fix right now which is that your communication about these high frequency routes is misleading in some cases because they show a higher level of service than you're actually planning. The best example I have of that is through West Roxbury where you show the 35 and the 36 being from 5 a.m. to 1 a.m. high frequency when in fact they are not planned for that level of service. And I've since learned that there are other routes that show weekend service designated by the color on the map where that's not actually planned in the schedule. Your presentation of these things should reflect those simple presentations you have on the map. Uh, and if, if the planned service doesn't reflect those, you know, dark blue, dark brown colors, then you should, you should change them and make that more clear. Thank you. Thank you, Patrick. Doug, I will turn it over to you for next steps and um, where we go from here. Great. Thank you very much, everyone who attended this meeting. Um, we really appreciate your engagement in this process, the time you took uh, to attend this meeting, watch the presentations, ask questions, and submit comments to us. Um, we really appreciate the effort you've put into this, and we all on the project team care very, very deeply about this and are really committed to creating a better bus network. Um, I hope that you'll stay involved in this process as we move into implementation. Um, if you don't already get emails about this project, um, you will be added to the project email address by virtue of the fact that you registered for this meeting. Um, so you'll begin to receive emails about this project 
Um, but I encourage you to continue to check the project website as well in the future and to stay engaged and continue to help us create the best bus network that we possibly can. Um, thank you all very much and have a great night.